part as well that there's this is going to get kind of nutty. Uh, I'm not speaking on what I'd plan to speak on. In fact, actually, Dr. Tesla was going to come in tonight. He had something he's going to share that lined up with uh, the part I did about um, the thinking to change the times and the law. So um, let's see here. Okay, nice. Well, don't need that. All right. <clears throat> anyway, um, let me silence my phone or it'll make a lot of noise here. <clears throat> I, I, I ran across something and I've known about this before. By the way, that good looking guy there sitting next to me there to the left is going to be on with me tomorrow night. On Israeli News Live, so I think you guys will uh, find that an interesting interview. So, what's I tomorrow night? You made, it you made it in. All right, let's see here. My phone goes off ninety to nothing. That's normally why I keep the ringer part of it off because. The other day I counted, I had 96 different people texted me. I'm like, good gosh, I'm not answering all that. So, but anyway. Only 96? No, it's not bad, is it, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> then my oldest daughter, she really gave me a hard way to go. She said, uh, I forgot about her getting married. Cause she told me last year, right? She said, well, daddy, I sent you two reminders. So when did you send those? So she sends me texts that she'd sent to me. That's my own daughter. I never saw the text. I I'm sure I probably saw it pop up or something, but I just didn't have time to read it. So, so I'm in the doghouse with her right now. Anyway. All right. Brother... Galen, God bless you, my brother. I was just talking about you. So, hey. How are you, brother Steve? Yes, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yourself? I'm good. Thank you. You sound like you got stuck in the bathroom. They don't let you out of there, did they? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. You got just you Dave, do you live in America or do you live in Europe? Yeah, I'm I live in Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. You know, your house sounds like a European house. Huh. Because it's, well you have, you, have like brick, so. you have brick walls and stuff or um well the outside is, yeah. It's just it, it is it is a it is brick. And it's brick on the outside. Yep. <clears throat> that's in Europe. That's what it reminded me of when I heard you speaking. It sounded like uh, huh. I haven't. No, I'm American, born, born and raised in California, and live in Missouri now. There you go. Sounds good. Anyway, Galen's going to share something with us here in a little bit. Uh, and what we're going to do, Galen, what I was sharing with people is that there's some things you're going to share with us. Uh, I'm actually going to go down a different road than what I thought about, but I do believe what you've got will be still important to go with it. Hang on one second. All the creditors come to my door to knock on it to come in the house. It's not like they don't have their own door to come in. They don't seem to think that I'll get up and open the door for them. Come on. No chickens allowed. I don't need to hear your meowing. The chickens will show up too. So, Galen, I just installed that kind of wall on my bathroom wall there because my wife said she'd give up on waiting for me to tile it. 
because uh, I've been sitting there with a wall with no with nothing on it for three years. So she decided that that kind of wood, which I, I got the tongue and groove one there, so I put the tongue and groove one on. Good night. Every animal on the planet comes to the door. Come on, you two. You can walk a little faster. That would be helpful. Come on. Come on. All right. Yeah. The chickens will be here next. But we're not opening the door for chickens. Uh, anyway. We'll forget about the wall there that it took me three years to do because that's a sore subject. But I did it. That's the good part. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what, before I get started into this, Galen, can you share with us a little bit about what you were telling me about earlier? Well, um, just very briefly, um, everything that you teach about with... You know the the uh, the movement in the Middle East and uh, and everything to go along with it. Um, there's fraud on different levels that came out of Babylon, and one of them was the calendar. And so this group called the Covenant Calendar Group Study Group has really worked out. I, and I didn't embrace it at first, but but basically they take. Um, everything back to God's original calendar, which was not a lunar calendar. It was a solar based calendar where each year begins uh, after the so uh, spring, spring equinox. I just about to say solstice, the spring equinox. And so this affects the feasts and every everything else, the Sabbath. And so it's a very deep study. It uh, proves that the, the, the day really begins at dawn and not at sunset and so these are things that everyone needs to prove to themselves and study to show themselves approved and and so on but it's very exciting because it sets so many things right and it literally explains uh, i believe it's in john 4 about how jesus did not come to the feast of tabernacles at the same time as his apostles and he stayed behind in Jerusalem with his uh, when his family left because he knew what the proper feast days were for Passover. And so it's just very fascinating and uh, very enjoyable. The, the, the teaching is very elaborate uh, and slow paced because there's a lot of information. But um, anyway, all of that stuff's Steve supports everything you're teaching. And that's why I brought it up when I saw what you were teaching on, on the Patreon channel uh, earlier in the week. So I yield. That sounds very interesting. Uh, just to kind of uh, support what you just said about the solar versus lunar, uh, that, that would probably shock a lot of people because they're so used to uh, modern Judaism, uh, and of course their argument that we that they followed a 360 day year, but if you go and um, go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, David wrote 365 Psalms, not 360, not 100, and I think it's 56. I think we have in our in our Bible, but 365. And in one of those psalms, he states, I have written a psalm for every day of your year. And uh, so that's fascinating. And also, uh, Rachel Elori, uh, she is a professor, I forget which university, I, know, I think she also teaches at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She's an Israeli. And she also noted uh, in uh, several of her speeches on the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the Qumran community followed a solar calendar and not a lunar calendar. So that's of, of interest for sure, uh, to, to, say, to say the least on that. All right, here's what we're gonna look at here. And let me find the uh, right. 
Let's see here. I got to remember how to minimize this rascal down. Maybe I can just go straight to screen share. That might help there. Right, that's just the biblical part, but it does allow me to get into here. There we go. That's what I needed to minimize down. Uh, there is a, a book, and I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with this, called The Apocalypse of Peter. And I wanted to give you a little context about this book before I discuss something that I ran across in here that piqued my interest, especially in light of some of the things that I've been teaching lately that have that has really just really even surprised me because so many uh, scriptures, whether it be the book of Revelation, uh, Daniel, things like that, I totally had a different idea completely than what I'm seeing right now. So for some reason or another, I ended up, uh, and I think what I did is I think, you know, sometimes when I'm bored, when I say bored, I'm not bored because I don't have anything to do, but I'll be doing things and I'll just decide, okay, I want to listen to a particular um, uh, biblical passage or or I might go back and, and look at some of the other uh, uh, documents that are out there and just uh, if there's an audio file, I'll just listen to it. Well, I remember there was one called the Apocalypse of Peter, but I couldn't remember where it was at. Why did we have it, et cetera? I just decided to click on it and listen to it. Now, we initially had this uh, in the Ethiopic Bible is where it was initially, and of course still is naturally, it's not never left their Bible. But there have been two fragments uh, that have been found since then, as well as Eusebius, uh, one of the earliest church fathers there uh, mentions this book as well. But two fragments were found. One was found uh, in the uh, late 1800s uh, over in Egypt. And, uh, and the other one, a Greek uh, version of that particular writing, was also discovered. Um, and it was a 5th century um, fragment. And, and this is, I just want to read a little bit right here said, prior to the end of the 19th century, little was known about the apocalypse of Peter beyond its existence in the early church lines, 71 to 72, of the Mur Muratorian fragment claim. We receive only the apocalypse of John and Peter, though some of us are not willing that the latter be read in church. Um, Eusebius, and that's really mentioning the apocalypse of John, is uh, what they don't want to be read in church. That one does take you down a pretty wild road, by the way. If you've ever, if you've never read it, and you decide you want to read it, uh, be sure to wear a seatbelt. Anyway, uh, so he goes on. He says he, he first says uh, uh, Eusebius mentions the Apocalypse of Peter twice in regard to the canon. He first says, on the other hand, in the case of Acts attributed to him, Peter, the gospel that bears his name. The preaching call, called his and the so-called revelation, we have no reason at all in, to include these among the traditional Catholic scriptures. For neither in the early days nor in our own has any church writer made use of their testimony. So that was Eusebius commenting on it. But keeping in mind, uh, I, I differ a lot with Eusebius personally, but uh, the... Um, a lot of the church fathers, they tend to be more of the, uh, you know, when the church was first putting together the books of the Bible that they were going to, to canonize and not canonize uh, during Nicaea Rome. Uh, this is why I'm not very favorable towards a lot of their, their thoughts on there. But if you moved down a little bit further as they're talking about this book here, this one here, uh, this all changed in the winter of 1886-1887 when a team of French archaeologists discovered a codex Akamim Egypt, or in Akamim Egypt, which contained fragmentary copies of the Gospel of Peter, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Greek Book of Enoch, and the uh, Martyrdom of St. Julian. Uh, and the dates, the copies of the Apocalypse of Peter found at Akamim 
any, they dated anywhere from the 6th to the 12th century. And but there were a lot of different fragments, just like the Nag Hammadi, uh, which bears its name from where the writings were found at in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Um, a lot of books have been found down in Egypt because uh, a lot of the, uh, back when Israel was dispersed in 70 AD, the people went either to the south to Egypt or they went to Syria to Damascus. And so, and there were two different schools there um, are two different uh, groups there of believers in both places. Uh, Syria has lasted much longer, though, than, of course, the Egyptian believers, uh, you know, as far as that goes. The main reason I bring this up here is just to kind of give the book some validity, uh, because we're just going to look at one particular instance uh, of this writing in here. And it's when Peter writes about the fig tree, quoting Jesus about the fig tree. And before I quote what Peter says here, let me enlarge this so we're make sure I can enlarge it. I think that's the right. There we go. Before we get into quoting it, I want to take you why this is a curiosity for me. And I'm sure many of you already know this. Now the chickens are at the door. No, they're not coming in. They will help themselves, though, if the door is open. Um, if you back up in Matthew 24, and... I'm going to back up far enough here. Let's start with verse 20. Because I think the apocalypse of Peter is going to make more, make help us to better understand Matthew's record of this. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. By the way, that's, that's going to be very important, verse 23, right there, when we read here in the Apocalypse of Peter in just a moment. When they shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ, plural, notice that it is plural, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, Believe it not, I just realized something that I never saw before. I got to show this to you guys right now, in fact. Let me unhighlight verse 26. They say to you, he is in the desert. Okay, we're going to highlight that one, make it blue. And he says, go not forth. Well, I made it purple. Let's make the other one purple too then. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. I'm curious if anybody, whoop, I keep, whoop, I'm messing everything up. Good night, I am messing that up. Let's get back. Let me just get this last part highlighted. Okay. I'll leave the desert. I'm not going to mess with them more because I'll mess it all up. I am really curious if anybody realizes what we're looking at right here in verse 26. Or at least pick up the thought that I have here. Brother Steve, right. you're on a yeah. search for fig trees. What's showing? Am I still on the fig tree thingy? Yep. Okay. Let me hit the stop share.
That's why y'all can't tell nothing. Okay, hang on. Let's go back. Thank you, uh, Brother Ron. All right, here we go. Can you see? Y'all can see it now, right? Verse 26. We're in Matthew 24. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. And they're talking about the false Christ, right? Yeah. Now, what's fascinating to me is the way he just worded that in light of Daniel. I'm going to show you the point. I want to see if you guys... I mean, I know you'll see it once I show it to you. That's kind of cheating, gosh. But then again, I wouldn't have known it either. All right, so Zechariah, no, not, what was it? No, Zechariah, no. Yeah, Zechariah 11. All right. Let me get, oh, no, maybe it's not Zechariah 11. Uh, let me think real quick. I got to remember where I'm supposed to go. Maybe Zechariah. Nope, not Zechariah 10 either. I think it's something in the wrong book. Um, Daniel is what I want. Daniel 11. Now, remember when I said the king of the south, what his name really means? It's the king of the Negev. He's the king of the desert. Okay. Now it's just, I don't, and this may be the most coincidental scripture I've ever seen, but it's fascinating because the king of the north, right there, is Melakatsaphon. And that literally means. A hidden king or a, like a secret is what it is. So if you go back to Matthew 24, talking about the false Christ, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. And yet we have two kings, according to Daniel 11, and one is a desert king, and the other one is a hidden king. Sadot is the word secret in Hebrew, if we say, or if we were to say the word secret. But uh, Tzaphon is, uh, is similar to that because it is a hidden place. And that word secret chamber would easily, if you were to translate that to Hebrew, you could use Tzaphon. Or sudot. Sudot, more than likely not, because you're using the word chamber. So therefore, if you're going to say it with the word chamber, it's going to be tzafon instead of sudot. So that's just kind of weird. Anyway, whereas the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, and in the Hebrew Matthew, it actually says wheresoever the buzzards are. There will, excuse me, I'm sorry, where the carcass is, there will be the buzzards, and they put eagles will be gathered together. Now, I can remember from many, many years ago, I was always taught, that's a great scripture right there. Wherever the carcass is, the eagles, and we're supposed to all be eagles, and we're gathered together to feast on the carcass. But if you look at the context of the, of the scripture to begin with, it's not a good thing in the first place. So why would we think it's a good thing even afterwards? So when you look at the Hebrew Matthew, which, by the way, Nehemiah Gordon has done an amazing job at proving that the uh, Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew follows the idioms of the original Matthew better than the Greek Matthew does. So, which we know that Matthew wrote in Hebrew to begin with, so it does make more sense why it would follow, follow through. Now, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now remember, was it Paul that wrote this? Um, 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, yes, Paul, but against powers. Literally, archaea is what's used in the Greek there, the archons are what we use. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against archons. So you have here, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I'm going to get everybody confused before I tell you all what we're going to find out today. So, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And this is where it gets interesting. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Now, I always heard that represent the modern state of Israel. That's the good Zionist Schofield theology of believing it. But it actually is not too far off. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. All right, but that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. And he goes into the days of, the, of Noah, right? But the thing about the fig tree almost is like, what does that really mean then? Most people will say, well, Israel types the fig tree. But not the house of Judah. That's what I didn't realize. And the other thing is, I've dealt with the, the apocalypse of Peter before. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a couple of things here. Let's first then go back to the apocalypse of Peter. Wow, how did that one come? Oh, that's... I don't know about you guys. I get all these stupid advertisements that pop up every time now I click a link. I guess I got some kind of spam thing in my email or not email, but somehow or another I got it. Here we go. All right. Now, there's a lot of commentary in this particular book that's written on this. So and I like reading it a lot, a lot of times this way because I like to see what other scholars are speaking on on these issues about the writings helps me to be able to get an idea of different thoughts. He says, this is Jesus speaking. Did you not receive that the fig tree, and we're right, by the way, we're right here, that the fig tree is the house of Israel? Christians. Well, hang on. That's that's going to get interesting. And, 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 and you may be very well right. All right, because I'm going to throw something at you, and you probably already, you already know this, but uh, but let's watch this. I have told you when its branches bud in the end, false messiahs will come. Notice the pluralization of messiahs or Christ, Mashiach, okay, Christ. The word Greek word is anointed ones, right? Same thing, Matthew wrote up here. Let's see. There shall arise false Christ, mm -hmm. plural. Mm -hmm. All right. Now the scholars wonder because he changes from plural to singular. And then it says, and he will promise. Now it's a singular. He, what? This false Messiah. But it goes from plural to singular. He will promise, I am the Christ who has come into the world. And when they see his evil deeds, they will turn away. Who turns away? The house of Israel does. Now let's go a little further down. And they will reject him right here who is called the glory of our ancestors. Now, trying to figure out the antecedent for this is a little bit difficult, 
but I am assuming the, the they now is referring to the uh, false messiahs plural. Because we have to go back to a the, or or you know or there again, and when they see his evil deeds, they will turn away. And they will reject, no, I'm sorry, that would still be applied to the house of Israel then. They will reject him who is called the glory of our ancestors. Who crucified the first Christ. And erred exceedingly. Okay, I may, actually, I think I get that myself. You guys let me know what you think on that. I, I believe what this is referring to here. It's almost like it's coming out of the house of Judah, this false Christ. Because it said, they will reject him who is called the glory of our ancestors. Undoubtedly, just like we have in the modern state of Israel now, you got to remember, they're trying to bring forth the Messiah because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They've totally rejected him. And as we see here, who crucified the first Christ and he erred exceedingly. That was the house of Judah. Although Peter in the book of Acts lays also to the house of Israel the same charge, but you got to remember the house of Israel at that time were not even accepted into the covenant until the day of Pentecost, which biblical scripture, the way it was supposed to be. First, the house of Judah, so the house of uh, Israel would not lift up its foot against the house of Judah. That was actually a prophecy about that says, and there will be many martyrs that at the time when the branches of the fig tree, this alone is the house of Israel, have budded, there will be many martyrs by his hand. That's the Antichrist that does it. Now, if you begin to uh, pay more attention to what the Noahide laws will do, yep. and then you realize why did they put Jesus to death? Because he claimed to be the son of God. And he didn't even say it himself. He was asked that question by Caiaphas, the high priest. He said, art thou the son of God? And he said, thou sayest. And then he rips his garment and he says, what further need we? You've heard his blasphemy for yourself. So claiming that Jesus Christ is the son of God is considered blasphemy, violating of the Noahide laws is death penalty. So if they're not willing to accept this new glory of their ancestors as the Messiah, like I think it was you, Brother Dave, that made that mention earlier there, Christians, they're no doubt they're believers already and that they're basically waking up to what the truth really is. Because they're going to reject this movement and, and think about the, how, how huge this movement has been. You got people like uh, Rabbi Shapira uh, who's gone forth along with uh, Mark uh, Belts and uh, and I know Mark, but Mark has gone down this, and, and, and I hate to say it, but Hebrews can be a very dangerous thing. You know, if you read some of the uh, the uh, the books, like I think Mark quotes it, and uh, not Mark, Thomas, and the one they found in Egypt, which they do believe should be canonized, he clearly says you can't serve two masters and he calls it the law or the gospel of Christ. So evidently there, this, this is, this, and by the way, this is where uh, messianic teachers are really getting Christians today to fall for uh, the, the unconditional support of Israel is saying we're going back to our Jewish roots. And notice what he says right here. And they will reject him who is called the glory of our ancestors. So he's not only being called like glorious ones, so to speak, 
but they're relating him to ancestral lineage. No doubt they're going to claim that he's the one that's bringing forth the law and re resetting up the true worship the way it was 2,000 years ago. And this is why so many books are being written right now by um, Jewish scholars about uh, Jesus, and they're trying to Judaize him for you so that you will accept what's coming forth. Now, notice also it says, and there will be many martyrs. You know, recently, and let me pull this up. I uh, don't know if it'll let, let you guys go with me, but I'll try. In Revelation, and I didn't, I really did not. Okay, Revelation. Are y'all able to see where I switched over to the Bible thing on here? No. Okay, I'll I'll pull it up on this on the screen then. Thank you. All right, so we want Revelation. You can see it now, though, correct? Yeah. Okay. See what I mean about how it jumps up? It, it immediately threw a stupid Nike commercial up. Lovely. Mine does that too. I have to confess, though, I was looking for an old pair of Nike shoes that I had about eight years ago that were very comfortable. And back in those days, I bought like four pair and I finally wore the last pair out. So I was trying to find another old pair I could buy online. Uh, preferably not ones that somebody else wore out too, you know, but you know, so I guess they know that. And so they're going to help me find a Nike that I don't want. Um, all right, Re Revelation 6. All right, guys, let's see here now. Get to the right verse. This is going to be verse 11. Now, and I forget exactly what I said recently about this particular scripture, but I read it as part of one of the ones we were uh, just did a T when I was doing the seals the other day, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long? O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that are dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season unto their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they would should be fulfilled. Now, I knew that the ones that are crying out, I was pretty convinced, and I still am, these are the early Jewish believers, the early apostles that were martyred for the testimony for Jesus Christ. If you remember, like Jesus said to Peter, he said, the way that you would not, that's the way you will go. He was signifying that by the way he would die. In other words, in the beginning, when he said he was willing to die with Jesus, but he cowered out and he wouldn't do it. I shouldn't pick on him because I could only imagine what that would be like. Uh, and I'll tell you a little testimony about that, too. I always want to be careful about picking on these Bible characters because we don't never know what they went through. Years ago, and I mean years and years and years ago, I was looking at Adam and Eve. And I'd heard a minister make the, make the statement that Adam gave in and gave in to his wife. And partook of the, he, he gave in to his wife, took the took the forbidden fruit, right? And I yes. made the big bold statement, and I said, I'd never be like Adam, boy. I tell you, bless God, I'd put my foot now. <laughs> right? Well, the day came, and I was probably about 23 years old. And me and my wife went through a really difficult time. And I find myself caving in. And I'll never forget, the Lord spoke to me audibly where I could hear him. And he said, I thought you wouldn't do like Adam would do. 
you want to talk about feeling shorter than an ant, um, the humbleness of hearing him say that to me. And I then understood better, of course, having no idea what Adam really went through. But it wasn't that Adam meant to do anything wrong, but it was his love for his wife. And so we, the thing that, that, that the Lord wanted me to understand then was you don't know what he was dealing with. You don't understand the pressure he was under, you know, and his wife, she wasn't trying to do anything necessarily bad. She, she thought she was doing right, but they made the mistake together. And that's when I learned to step back and go a little slower about things. Anyway, we'll go back to this here now. So, so the thing was, though, as I was looking at this here, or, or when I looked at this one in Peter there, it said every one of them was given, they were given, uh, excuse me, it said they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants, also their brethren, they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld when, I, when he opened the sixth law, a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs and is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, even what's written here in verse 13, if you go back to Matthew, and when all this has taken place here, let's see. Um, Yep. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. The planet's coming. And that may very well be what does it. I think so, that's the right. But, but do you notice how the similarities begin to line up? It's just like last night when I did that message uh, last night. I, I showed you how that Jesus puts all the death of the apostles and the pro excuse me the prophets and the righteous not the apostles but, but the pro the prophets and the righteous he he indicted them in Matthew 23 verse 35 he indicts the Pharisees for all the deaths all the way back to, to uh, uh, Abel and yet we know they weren't there during the times of Abel but yet he indicted them their family, their forefathers, all the way back to that time frame. Cain's they, children were there, though. Do what now? I said Cain's children were there in Adam's time. Well, then he tells you real quick, like then, that they're part of Cain's children then. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole point of that. But when you look over in the book of Revelation, like I brought out last night, and then I'll show you that verse in there, where they're they're held guilty for the deaths of the prophets. So it lets you know the very nation in the Middle East right now that's waging all these wars against all their neighbors are fulfilling prophecy right. on a mass scale. And then we, we look at this right here, all right? So we come back to Matthew here. All right, and let me let me go back then over to that. Let's see where is it. Going back to what Jesus says to Peter in this document called the Apocalypse of Peter. He says they will reject him who is called the glory of our ancestors, who crucified the first Christ and erred exceedingly. But this liar is not the Christ, and when they resist him, he will wage war with the sword. And there will be many martyrs. Then at that time, when the branches of the fig tree, this alone is the house of Israel, have budded, there will be many martyrs by his hand. And they will die and they will be martyrs. Indeed, Enoch and Elijah will be sent in order to instruct them that this is the deceiver 
who will come in the world and perform signs and wonders to deceive it. Now I see why people always believe Enoch and Elijah is the two witnesses versus Moses and Elijah. And, uh, and that was something I was not aware of until I read that there. So if we come here now, again, this alone is the house of Israel when the branch of the fig tree puts forth its buds. It's almost as if just as Judah rejected Christ, except for the few that came out, these also, the house of Israel. And I, if, if I'm not mistaken, there's another place scripturally where it is typed out. Maybe it's in this same book here. I forget now, but uh, where he quotes the uh, prophecy. Uh, I, I want to say it's Ezekiel's prophecy. Prophesy unto these bones, O son of man, can these bones live again? And uh, I think in Ezekiel's prophecy, he also says this is the whole house of Israel. So I'm going to actually dig deeper into this because as I, the more that I dig into this, the more I'm finding out the overlapping prophecies just seem to never end. Um, and let me just see where, where we might have next before I pull off of this. Yeah, commentators give too much commentary. Okay, that's all they do is they just cover that part only. All right. There's more to that book than that. It's just uh, I was only focused on some of their commentaries as well. So I've got to go back and do some studying, uh, like I said, about like the, the valley full of dry bones uh, and do some comparison with the scriptures here. Um, and, and then, of course, this one that tonight that caught my attention to. Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Um, That's in our heart. Yeah. But in comparison to Daniel's prophecy, that's what's got me wondering if there's a connection to the two of those. So. Um, Matthew 24, 22. I don't, I don't think it could be the heart, and I'll tell you why. Unless they're trying to say that the, uh, I get what you're saying in that, in the regard that they might try to say that. In other words, like, Oh, uh, it's kind of like their fake Holy Spirit, so to speak. Um, oh, yeah. And they're telling whoever's here, that's Jesus. Right. And we know that, no, Jesus is inside of us. He's not out there somewhere. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So anyway, if you guys have any questions, we'll do that. Uh, can I, just, I, can I show you something real quick? Sure. I don't know if you're aware. Um Matthew 24, 22, it talks about um, that, I can't, yeah, right except here. those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Well, that's, we read, uh, Revelation 9 tells us how long it's been shortened to. Not seven years, but five months. Let's go to Revelation 9, we'll look at that then. Do you know what verse that is in Revelation 9? Uh, it's down just a little bit, not very far. Uh, here. And to them it was given that they should not kill them. They should be tormented five months. So it's talking about um, Christians. that they, That's who they're after the, from the Noahide laws. Right. And, the, yeah. and the, so the tribulation is five months, not seven years. And it's May through September. I want to share, one thing I wanted to share with you guys because I almost forgot to do it. Um, this is actually in a museum here in Tennessee, not far from where I'm at. I want to go see it now that I know about it. Uh, I've I've seen this type of things before. That's Paleo Hebrew, 
And that was an inscription that was found at a archeological site in Tennessee, uh, an Indian burial ground. And, um, and I think in Paleo Hebrew, it stands for, for the Judeans, something to that effect. But um, it's very interesting. And the reason why I bring this up is because the um, several artifacts amongst the Cherokee Indians have been found uh, over the uh, last decades here. Uh, and in every case, it's always Paleo-Hebrew. Right. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why no one ever recognizes that it's Hebrew at first. And it's normally uh, with some type of burial. And I think it's not just limited to the Cherokee nation. But what I find interesting in this is that it's Native Americans. And then when you go to the modern state of Israel, a lot of your Jewish people that came back to the promised land that were considered outcast by society were the Arab Jews, uh, the, Ar the Armenians, uh, not Armenians, but the uh, uh, down from uh, Yemen. Yemenite Jews, the Yemenite Jews, the Iraqi Jews, the Iranian Jews, uh, including the Palestinian Jews. Uh, we know that uh, it was believed by uh, the, the first prime minister of Israel, Ben-Gurion, that more than 50% of what they called Palestinians were of Jewish descent, Jewish origin. Now, I saw that they did, they did what they call, they, they claim they did a DNA test on the Native American Cherokee, and they said they could not find a connection to Jewish bloodlines as a result. And then I thought to myself, then what are you basing your DNA research on? That's an interesting concept. If you're basing it on the Ashkenazi bloodline, sure, they may not be connected at all. Right. But what about what about the Sephardic bloodline? What about the uh, the the Yemenite Jews and things like that, maybe there's a connection to them. And then, of course, we see the way that the Native American people look. Uh, in fact, my great grandmother, I got a picture hanging up here on the back wall here. Uh, she's extremely dark. Uh, looks nothing like the regular white person at all. And that's because her mother was full-blooded Creek Indian. Uh, now that's watered down in me a good ways after, you know, my grandmother, you know, I guess, well, her daughter would be a quarter, my mother would be an eighth, so I'm a 16th. Uh, but, but nonetheless, it's just interesting that they have more of what I would say would be a Middle Eastern look. Uh, because Native Americans, they don't even really look what we would, at least on the, on the East Coast of America, they did not look like Spanish people or Oriental people. Right. They looked more Arabic as far as, to some degree, if you were to look at you know a similarity of the way they would look like that. So I just found this interesting anyway. Not that it is you saying know, that- Have you ever heard of Chief Riverwind? No, I have uh, not. He's not Cherokee, but his wife is. And um, I, he's- Florida uh, Indians, but I can't remember what they're called. Somehow. And he said that, or she said that all of the tradition is very much what the Bible teaches. Uh, you know, they had Passover, they went through all of the everything. And that's what she grew up with. Yeah, I can believe that. I, I you. We knew a uh, we knew a chief uh, of the Cherokee Nation here who was the spiritual leader chief of the Cherokee Nation, uh, and uh, he was full blooded Cherokee. His his wife was full blooded Cherokee. Uh, Brother Ron, you also are Indian descent, if I'm not mistaken. Um, is that right? 
Yes, I've got, I'm registered with the Saponi Nation, part of the Creek and Sioux. And also both of my great grandmothers were full-blooded Cherokee. And some of the other ancestors were Cherokee. I went to Tahlequah down at Cherokee Nation headquarters and took a 40 hour class on their history and stuff. Well, There's now you know you'll be a martyr, brother. Okay. So I just, I'm just messing with <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, go ahead. Yeah, Steve, I've been hearing from a lot of different people. Um, they're starting they're starting to see things from other dimensions. In fact, my one friend, she saw a white and a black giant. Enough who, one. Who saw that? One of my friends. I can believe it. And uh, uh, a friend of mine, before he went into retirement, uh, that would share intel with me, had said to me that, this was coming that they and this was before we even had the first report of it. Uh, he said that the dimensions will begin to merge together. And he said, as they merge together, he said, you will start to see creatures. Uh, he said, whether they be alien, whether they be uh, similar to humans, whether they be dinosaur looking creatures, he said, uh, he said, what happens is those dimensions merge together. He said, it's, you're going to basically, he said, wherever they're living at in a parallel universe, he said, suddenly it might be that your living room happens to be their living room, or it might be their grocery store, so to speak, uh, or it might be a dinosaur's backyard somewhere where, you know, he's playing <laughs> fetch with Spot out there. But uh, so then it's a good reason for men's hearts to fail them. Exactly. Uh, exactly, Dave. Uh, and I think that that's what we're, you know, in fact, that was actually something we had discussed at the time uh, when he told me this. He said, you know, Steve, he said, I just wonder. Because he said the Bible says that man's hearts are going to fail them for fear for things that are coming up on the earth. He said, now, is that because dimensions merging? Or he said, will that be inner earth creatures that come out? He said, that's another thing that we're going to have happen. And he said, uh, he said, dinosaurs do live in the earth. He said, but dinosaurs are like puppy dogs. He said, compared to what's really in the earth. Uh, he Steve? Said, yeah. That incident down in down in Miami at the mall. New yes. information is out. Yes. Uh, those entities were really there as well as the one in Las Vegas. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And, and they are, and you're going to see more of it. The, the thing is, the big issue that's coming up next is going to be the magnetosphere. Uh, and I actually asked the question because I know that I first heard this from uh, from Harold. We were talking one day and he said to me, he said, you know, the magnetosphere is going to collapse. And uh, at that time, that was in 2023. And he was thinking it was going to happen by the year's end of 2023. Uh, my friend in DC said no. Uh, it wouldn't be in 2023. So, but I asked, finally one day it just kind of occurred to me, I said, how do you guys even know this is going to happen? And, uh, you know, I said, because it seems to be there are so many, uh, you know, different people that I'm in connections with that are talking about it, but how do you guys know? And he said, well, we work with extraterrestrial entities and they're the ones that have told us that it's coming. That's what I was told. That they work with them. They've been told that these things are coming. Now, oddly enough, uh, in the uh, uh, writings in Egypt that they had, they it speaks about that the dimensions would collapse in upon one upon the other. 
uh, and that the stars would not keep their circuit. Well, Matthew says the stars won't keep their circuit. Revelation says the stars will not keep their, their circuit. Uh, so here we are seeing very similar verbiages to what we have written in the Egyptian works. Uh, and at the same time, scientists and intel uh, people speaking about that, the very thing that, that we see, it's not only that we hear about happening, but people are getting proof that it's happening. So I can only imagine people losing their minds because of seeing things like that, some kind of weird creature from some other world and then not know how to deal with it. Um, I, I wouldn't know how to deal with it. So go ahead, Brother right. Dave. You got to unmute, Brother Dave. You still you still muted, brother. In the apocalypse of Peter, where it says there will be many martyrs by his hand. You think that's what all those guillotines are for? I think so. Uh, I do think that this is going to be with the um uh, with this Noahide law push that they're gonna do. And it would make sense because if Israel is, uh, I mean, because it clearly shows too that the very ones that crucified Christ will be the ones that are pushing this new Messiah. Uh, so it would have to be the leaders of the modern state of Israel. Um, I really, do, I don't know if you guys saw that though, where I played that Jewish lady that was on Al Jazeera that just broke down. Yeah. I thought that was so nice, you know, to see um and the courage that she has because she said she was beat up pretty bad for for speaking out she said they're trying to figure out where she lives somebody's going to give her place away and that's horrible because she won't be safe at that point so it's got you muted still brother dave jesus says he's going to take his elect into the wilderness just before the antichrist is thrown out of heaven yeah. So King Charles as the Antichrist, he's not been, uh, Satan's not in him yet, but he soon will be. We, we, we're going to find out a whole lot of things here. Steve? And, uh, yes. The other thing that there's some kind of s symbolic thing going on with uh, King Charles and um, the guy from the WEF from the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab and Trudeau and one other person. Okay. Yeah, they're they're all in red. It's some kind of it's well, yeah, some yeah, kind of subliminal that, message. That, right. The painting that they did they unveiled of him. You know, that's interesting in itself because you know I would have never believed that the four horse riders had anything to do with Great Britain until just recently when I saw that video, and it may have been you, Elizabeth, that sent me that video there, is either you or Rosa one sent it to me when they were showing the two horses running down the street uh, there in Great Britain, and that's when it struck me, and and I knew the answer without even reading it, but I had to go back and search it out again, but when I saw it, then I realized this, it's not Rome, it's not the Vatican that get, got crowned, it's Great Britain. All right. And, uh, have and, you and, seen have you seen uh, Tim Cohen on YouTube talking about um, King Charles being the Antichrist? I have not. I have not. I He's have got not everything down to the nitty gritty. No. I mean, I never would have thought of it either, but he is, he is, uh, he's already been, you know, when he was crowned, they anointed him with olive oil from Jerusalem. Right. And he's supposedly um, part Arab because he's going to accept the Arabs in. He's um, the, the Jews from Netanyahu and the Chabad group, they all think he's wonderful. So they're all together. And King Charles is one that's been working all the way through all the who and everything else, the WHO and the everything. 
He's been in it's been in it all along. Not not only that, Steve. Um, there was that cloak figure at the coronation. Right. The green the black right here. figure that was cloaked. Oh yes, yes I forgot I'm what sure. they called it. Yeah. Grim Reaper. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to see some crazy things. Remember, though, you got to think about one thing, too. In the Apocalypse of Peter, he uses Antichrist in the plural sense to start with. And then finally, we come down to a singular. Right. So who knows what's going to be next? Anyway. All right, guys, I'm going to cut out of here for tonight. You guys be good. Seems like y'all are the only ones that know that we do this. Of course, I don't really say it a whole lot about doing this, but hey, it's all right. Makes it easier to talk to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right. God bless you guys. Y'all have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. Don't forget to stop your recording, Elizabeth. Oh.